Psalm 119. This morning, we're going to listen to verses 41 through 48. So I'm going to read them, then I'm going to pray, and then we're going to listen. Psalm 119, starting in verse 41. The psalmist says this, let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. Then I shall have an answer for him who taunts me, for I trust in your word. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for my hope is in your rules. I will keep your law continually forever and ever, and I shall walk in a wide place, for I have sought your precepts. I will also speak of your testimonies before kings and shall not be put to shame, for I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. I will lift up my hands towards your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. Let's pray this morning. Father, we ask in the time that we have together that you, you would do that which only you could do, which is to make your love for us in your Son known, seen, clear to our eyes and hearts, and to make it the most satisfying thing to us. We ask this morning that you would do that for Jesus' name's sake. Amen. Kunam, it's a real story, was a young Indian wife and mother who in 2012 quietly left Hinduism. And as the story goes, the Bible that she had obtained instantly became her most prized possession. She would secretly read that Bible every single day in her home growing in her understanding of God's love for her. However, one day, after overhearing her pray, her husband found her Bible, and in anger, he ripped it and tore it into pieces. He told her, from today, you stop reading the Bible. As long as you live in this house, you better not pray. Shortly after that, he beat her and then soon kicked her out of the house, refusing to let her see their young sons and daughter. A heart for Jesus seems to have cost this young woman everything, her family, safety, her well-being. The story goes that she stayed with relatives and prayed for the return of what had been lost, her family in particular. A pastor and another believer who lived near her relatives where she was staying would visit with her regularly, pray with her, and read the Bible with her. To her great joy, it said that one day these friends gave her a new Bible. And upon receiving that new Bible, she burst into tears. Over time, as the story continued on, her, her husband has, has not yet placed his faith in Jesus, but his heart has softened. Has softened. Punam is now back at home with him and her children, and her husband has even attended church a few times to see how Christians worship. Day by day, in her home, Punam continues to read and study God's word with her new Bible, but she will not give up the torn and tattered Bible that her husband tried to destroy. She said, quote, how could I? This is how I first learned about Jesus. My Bible is everything to me. It's the living word of God. Without it, I can't truly live. Though distanced by time, and geography. Punam and the psalmist were both facing a crossroad of sorts in their life. Their faith in God and their obedience to his ways have brought them to a point 
where continued faithfulness, continued obedience was going to cost them. You read the psalmist, not just in this stanza, but we could go to other stanzas where he speaks about it. He's facing intense ridicule. He's facing intense taunt, plotting. Kings and princes are plotting against him. His well-being is being threatened as he continues to follow God and his ways. For Punam, she faced the crossroad of continuing to surrender in faithfulness to Jesus at the cost of her physical safety and her family. A life surrendered to Jesus, the way of Jesus, is a life that is going to be the subject of misunderstanding, ridicule, opposition, and even at times, rejection. It didn't make their lives easier. Nothing about their life got easier. But here's the thing. It's always been this way. When you and I face similar crossroads, and the reality of it is, if we had the time, we could explore it in in more detail, but we face them on a daily basis of sorts. But when we face these crossroads and a life surrendered to the ways of the Lord, his word and his ways, and we face a crossroad where continued obedience to him and, and delight in him is going to cost us something a relationship, a a reputation, maybe even a job and our well-being with that, we somehow tend to think we're unique. That has never happened before. Somehow the sky is falling now because this opposition is showing, but it's always been this way. A life surrendered to Jesus and his ways lived in support, like we've talked about this morning, of of even the sanctity of life. A a life surrendered to his ways, rejoicing in the beauty of sexuality as God created it, male and female. Just two, just two, just two things. Just two particularly hot issues in our world today. A life surrendered to the way of Jesus in the eyes of a world that is walking in a different way. You're going to have all kinds of choice words and things said to you and about you. It may very well cost you. It may cost you relationships. It may cost you reputations. It may cost you jobs. But it's not sometimes even just a world that seems to be walking in a different way. A life surrendered to the way of Jesus, truly seeking to press your life through what it looks like to decrease so that he could increase, that you become less important in your eyes, that he might be more important, not just in your heart, but through your life. It's going to impact the way you prioritize your decisions, your time, the way you spend your money, the way you relate to other people. It's going to change the way you see and respond to life. Surrender to the way of Jesus with such intentionality that his heart, his compassion is lived out in action in real life towards others, in particular those who disagree with you about the way in which you're walking. You may just come to find that it's not just a world walking in a different way that begins to have choice words for you. And about you. It's even those who you thought who were closest to you. So when the crossroads appear and it gets difficult to live the way of Jesus, the pushback, the potential loss, it it all feels very tangible. And in our hearts, it, it might feel too great. What is it in those moments that we truly need? What is it that you truly need in those moments? Where do you find it? What difference would it actually make when faced with that crossroad? Well, that's the essence of what God has for us this morning in this particular stanza of the psalm. So let's listen to the psalmist this morning. And he he starts in verse 41, and it's kind of just the heartbeat of the stanza. It's where the bulk of our attention will be paid. But we have to consider what is it in, in facing this crossroad that it is we truly need. 
And I'll tell you, I, ha- I had a hard time in, in preparing for this morning wrestling with that question, in particular that word need, because we have a pretty unhealthy relationship with that word need. We tend to use that word in, in ways we, we might want to reel back if we really considered it. A need speaks of, of something that's truly essential. It's needed. And what it is we really think we need, the word is powerful, because what it is we really think we need, that which is essential, it's going to shape the trajectory of our days and our decisions because we're going to orient ourselves towards getting it. Because we think we need it. And we've got a fairly unhealthy relationship with that idea and that word. And I wish we had the time this morning to get into that. Well, come back. In weeks to come, we're going to deal with that down the road. But what is it that we really need? And so I stuck with the word. Because there is something essential. When the pressure rises and relationships and reputations are on the line for the sake of Jesus... If we're honest, a lot of times when we see ourselves at that crossroad, what we instinctively feel that we need is a way out, a strategy to save ourselves from potentially losing what we're threatened to lose while maintaining and holding tight to what we don't want to lose. How do we figure a way out of the hurt while keeping everything that we've got? We're looking for a strategy, a way that we can rescue ourselves from that fear, what it is that feels threatened. Well, in the psalmist, in verse 41, he shows us a a different inclination in the moment. He helps us to see more clearly what it is that we essentially need when facing these times in life. Verse 41, the psalmist says, let your steadfast love come to me. O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. In the face of the slander, the taunting, the plotting, the struggling against him, the psalmist helps us to see that our true need is a renewed taste for and a heart renewed by the steadfast love of God. Some of your Bibles there will say loving kindness. The psalmist says, let it come to me, renew me, revive me. Wash over me again with this. Your steadfast love, that's my salvation. According to all that you have said, your promise. You see, as you consider it, it's a regular refrain in the Psalms in particular. Just as an example, in Psalm 90, this is actually a Psalm of Moses, so we're we're going back in the history of God's people. And Psalm 90, verse 14, excuse me, Moses says, satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad in all of our days. Satisfy us in the morning. How often does morning happen? Every day. As long as God continues to uphold this entire universe by the word of his power, morning is coming the next day. So today and tomorrow and the next day and the next morning, satisfy me. Give to me. Renew me in your steadfast love that I may rejoice and be glad today and all of my days. That's what I need. David would say it this way in Psalm 143, I stretch out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. Let me hear in the morning of your steadfast love. What we need, what is most essential, what our heart is thirsting for and hungry for day by day. In the face of a crossroads, in the face of difficulty, and in the way of temptation, of compromise, when following the ways and the word of the Lord is going to bring into our lives 
that which we don't want, discomfort and loss and the face of the crossroads, what we need more than anything is the steadfast love of God for our hearts to be renewed by the steadfast love of God. What is it? Well, some of your Bibles, you're reading it now, and it actually says loving kindness. And it says steadfast love, and it'll say loving kindness because in English, we don't have a word that captures the fullness of the Hebrew word there. The Hebrew word is hesed. So when William Tyndale was translating the Bible into the English language from the Latin and from the Greek, he had to come up with a word, and he created this concept and this word of steadfast love. But even before Tyndale, when we were trying to translate the Bible from Hebrew into Greek, there was no word in the Greek language to capture the fullness of the Hebrew word hesed. And so in the Greek translation of the Bible, of which the English translation would eventually grow from, they used two words to translate that one word. And the two words that they would use to capture the fullness of the idea of God's steadfast love were the words mercy and grace. Mercy, not receiving what you deserve. Grace, receiving the very thing you didn't deserve. We need reminding that God has mercy on us. We need reminding that God is gracious towards us. We need reminding and renewal in our hearts day by day that we don't experience what we deserve with regards to our sins. And we need to be reminded day by day that in God's steadfast love, we receive from his hand that which we didn't deserve. For the psalmist, he, he would be captivated by the reality of God's continued steadfast love to him as he would see God over and over again in the story of his relationship with his people being faithful to his word and to his promise. But most clearly in his mind, I have to think, would, would come the story from Exodus 34 when God had rescued his people out of slavery in Egypt, bringing them towards the land that he had promised them. He, Moses had gone up on the mountain to hear from God, and when he came back down, he found the Israelites having made a golden calf, worshiping the golden calf, and, and having this celebration. And so Moses goes back to the mountain to intercede with God on behalf of his people. And you can read about it in Exodus 34. God meets him on that mountain. And this is how it reads, the Lord, Yahweh, passed before Moses and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. The psalmist has come to realize that what he needs flows from the very reality of who God is. What he needs is God himself. What he needs is a heart renewed in the reality of who God has been and continues to be for him. And for you and I, now reading this psalm on this side of God's story, we know that God's steadfast love and faithfulness his has said that which he is according to his character and promise is most clearly seen and revealed to us in Jesus. We know that what our hearts need most day by day, and particularly at the point of crossroad, when facing the resistance, when facing the fear, when facing the temptation, we, we know that what we need most is for our hearts to be renewed by God's faithfulness, to be renewed by what we call the gospel, the good news, that because of God's mercy and grace to us in Jesus, we don't experience what we deserve because of our sin, because Jesus experienced it in our place, that because of God's mercy and grace to us in Jesus, we receive something that we don't deserve, Jesus' perfect righteousness. We need our heart renewed and revived 
As long as it's called today by the steadfast love of God towards us, most clearly seen in his kindness towards us in his son. Facing the loss of reputation, facing the slander, facing the sacrifice for Jesus' sake, we need to be renewed by the truth that God has mercy on us. And we don't face what we deserve because of Jesus. We need to be renewed by the truth that God is gracious towards us, that he blesses us and accepts us and enjoys us because of Jesus. Paul would pray for the church in Ephesus this way, that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened, that we would know, not just like informational knowledge that we can categorize, but know in a renewed way. Know in a tangible way. Know in the depths of our heart and soul what's the hope to which God has called us. The riches of his glorious inheritance and the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us according to the working of his great might that he worked in Jesus when he raised him from the dead and seated him in his right hand in the heavenly places. That we would truly know and be renewed by who God is for us, his steadfast love and faithfulness, his grace and mercy to us in Jesus, and the hope, the hope, the tangible hope that is born out of a heart, renewed, by God's steadfast love. When our hearts are renewed by God's mercy and grace to us in Jesus, when our hope is deepened out of that renewal, man, it's like the the anxieties and, and the worries and the fears that we sense and feel when we face that crossroad, when we hear the slander and the Opposition is rising and the words are being spoken and the plottings against are happening and all the things that we're anxious about and we're fearful of and that. It's, it's almost as if God is saying as our hearts are renewed by his steadfast love and faithfulness and the hope, the hope that is ours because of the greatness of that steadfast love and faithfulness work to us most clearly in Jesus. We see it and we're renewed in it. It's almost as if those things begin to melt away in the presence of that love. It's like that love gets so hot and stoked so strong in our hearts as we're renewed in it, those things just begin to melt away in the presence of it. That's what Paul wants us to know is that hope. And it comes from having our hearts renewed again and again by God's has said, his steadfast love. I mean, what is it that we really need? Right? It's, not, it's not a clever justification that we can come up with and tell ourselves with that will allow us to get out from under whatever it is we fear we're going to experience while still maintaining everything we don't want to lose. And it's not this just strategy to save ourselves from the pressure and make it all work. But what we need is to be revived. Our hearts to be kick-started by the steadfast love of God. To see and enjoy Jesus And where do you see him? Where do you go to see him? Where can you go to be with him? Where can you go to be reminded again of the steadfast love of God that renews and restores? Well, you go where you know him to be. You go to his word. It's that which is according to his promise. That's where we go. We go to his promise. We go to his word. We go to that which he's given us that reveals himself to us. I love the way David Pallison, he was a Christian counselor, he wrote an article about this psalm, and he said this in particular about it. He said, this psalm is actually not about the topic of getting scripture into your life. That tends to be how we use Psalm 119. It's the beginning of the year, new resolutions are being made, we'll spend a week or two on reading and meditating and studying the Bible, reminder of getting your discipline straight and your practice straight and getting the Bible into your heart. Well, Pallison says if you, if you answer the question, what's the psalm about, and that's your answer, you're only partly right, because that's ultimately not what it's about. Pallison said what this psalm is about is this. It's not about getting the topic of the scripture into your life. Instead, we're overhearing the honest words erupting from a heart 
when what God has said has actually gotten into you. We're listening to the overflow of a heart that God's word has taken root in already. The overflow of a heart that is being renewed again as God reveals himself through his word and faithfulness of his love and mercy. And this is the heart behind what you hear us talking about when we talk about seeing Jesus together as we read the Bible. And when you look at the front of your, your worship guide, you see seeking Jesus together and there are those daily Bible readings. And the heart behind this and what we talk about and, and the journals, the seeing Jesus journals is, is you and I not just checking the box off a habit or a discipline we know is good for us. It's about us coming to the place where we know God to reveal his steadfast love and faithfulness till we know where Jesus is, where we can see him where we can be with him and we come with confidence and faith that he's there and that he's going to do the very thing he has promised according to his word and he's going to renew our hearts in his steadfast love. That's why we do it. We go to be renewed day by day, the psalmist says, according to God's steadfast love and faithfulness. If you don't know where to start, friends, we've got it on the front of your your bulletin there. And you can grab one of the journals on your way out. There's a a great introduction to why we do what we do, the way we do it, why we come and and we present ourselves before the Lord, honest and open before we read, telling him where our hearts are, the struggles of our hearts, being honest about the difficulties and then asking him to do this very thing. Incline our hearts towards him like we've seen the psalmist say. Renew me in your steadfast love because that's what I need today. And then we listen. Listen. We listen for his voice. We listen for him to help renew us and remind us in his word of his grace and mercy towards us so that our hearts begin to experience what we really need, what's really essential. Now, this is what the psalmist is helping us to see is the greatest need in the the moment of crisis and crossroad. It's the renewal of our heart. The rest of the psalm is actually the expression, like Paulus has said, the overflow of his heart, of the anticipated fruit of his heart being renewed by the steadfast love of God, the love of God coming to him again, renewing his heart again. Now we're going to hear him kind of express his anticipated fruit of being renewed in the face of all that he is dealing with. Let's just listen to him real quick. Verse 42, then, now that my heart is being renewed by your steadfast love and faithfulness, then shall I have an answer for him who taunts me, for I trust in your word. Verse 43, take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for my hope is in your rules. Verse 46, if you skip down, this this language of, of speaking is still there. I will also speak of your testimonies before kings and shall not be put to shame. So as his heart is increasingly renewed and steadied and satisfied by God's steadfast love for him, a reminder of of God's continued mercy and grace towards him, what he anticipates then in the face of this crossroad where all these things are coming against him. And he knows if he just... If he just shifts a little bit or compromises a little bit, maybe the taunts will die down. Maybe the plottings against him will begin to go away. What he anticipates as his heart is increasingly satisfied by God's grace and mercy to him again is a humble, courageous clarity. Then, as you've satisfied me again, then I'll know what to say. And I promise you, it will sound different. As our hearts are renewed day by day, increasingly in God's steadfast love for us in Jesus, all of a sudden in those moments, what we say will begin to sound a little bit different, I promise. It will begin to sound a little bit more like the one our eyes has fixed its hope and focus upon then I'll I'll know what to say. Oh, please, he says, don't don't take the word of truth out of my mouth. 
Right? I know I'm going to feel like I want to cower. I know I'm going to feel like if I say this, if I answer this, if I give a reason for the hope that's in me and why I'm living the way I'm living, it's only going to get worse. Please don't take it out of my mouth. I know what it feels like to want to, to shift away from having to face what that might mean. Don't take it out of my mouth. Give me the words to be able to speak. He anticipates as his heart is increasingly satisfied in God's grace and mercy to him, this ability to be able to continue to take step by step along the path of faithfulness to God and his ways with courage, with humility, and with clarity all at the same time. Verse 44, I I will keep your law continually forever and ever. Right, he anticipates this delight in the commandments, the law of God in such a way that walking in God's ways, or for you and I, walking in Jesus' ways, it, it becomes our joy as our hearts are increasingly satisfied by God's steadfast love to us. What other way could we go? As God continues to to show us with clarity the depth and the expansiveness of his steadfast love to us in Jesus. What other way is there for you and I to go to have life? Are we going to sound a little bit more like Peter? Where else are we going to go? Jesus said, you guys want to leave too? Everyone else is walking away. Everyone else wants to take a different path. What I've said is difficult. Do you want to go that way too? He said, where else am I going to go? You're the only one that has the words of life. And that's what the psalmist is saying here. As our hearts are increasingly satisfied by God's steadfast love to us day by day, his words become more clear to us as the words of life. All the other paths being laid out, all the other directions being laid out, we get better at seeing them for what they are. And the psalmist says, from now and until forever, it's your commands that I will delight in. I will keep them forever and ever. I mean, being captivated by God's steadfast love to us, being captivated by Jesus, you can't help but want to walk in his ways more. It's the dynamic that Jesus laid out for his disciples in John 14. Jesus said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. If anyone loves me, the Father and I will come to him and make our home with him. He didn't say, if you obey me, I'll love you. He says, it's out of a delight. It's out of a love for me. The fullest, most clearest manifestation of God's steadfast love and faithfulness has said to his people, it's your heart seeing and enjoying me. Loving me, delighting in me that produces this increased desire to keep his ways and commands. That's where it comes from. Anything else is ultimately just religious box checking. The Pharisees were really good at it. They had memorized the scriptures. They had been obedient to the commands. They created their own commands to help be obedient with the commands. And Jesus says, you've taken up these words that help reveal to you the steadfast love and faithfulness of the Father, and you think that right there you're going to find it. No, it's me. It's me. Seeing, Jesus said, they didn't see. See, it's love for him and satisfaction in him and hearts being increasingly satisfied by God's love to us in him that produces this kind of delight that says, like the psalmist, I want to keep your law continually. Where else am I going to go? Verse 45 is really part of that same expression when he says, I shall walk in a wide place for I've sought your precepts. Right? We talked about this last week. The precepts of God, the ways of Jesus, that's a life energized by the loving kindness of God and it's a life that leads to real freedom. The steadfast love of God, his detailed instructions, the precepts, the ways in which we should go, those aren't confinement. 
Those are freedom. Free to finally live and be satisfied by the very things we were created to be satisfied by and to walk in the ways we were created to live. God is the one who created you, who hardwired you, who purposed you. He knows what he created you to be satisfied by. He knows how he created you to live. His ways are the ways to life and freedom. And as our hearts are increasingly renewed by his steadfast love, we see more clearly that his ways are the ways to freedom. Anything else ultimately leads to death. This came more clear to me this week as I was reading a story. It had nothing to do with the Bible or Psalm 119, but it was one of those parenting anecdotes that, that you can read in magazines or whatever. But it was, it was telling the story of a, of a family of three kids, mom and dad, and dog. Every night they would have dinner, and as was their routine, they would then go and they would watch something on TV together in the, in the living room. Everybody would sit on the sofa, mom, dad, the kids, and the dog. They were all sitting there together doing this together. It's what they did every single night. Laughter, TV, stories, whole deal, right? Kids convinced mom and dad to get another pet, and they got a goldfish. And they put the goldfish in the living room where everything else was. And it was the responsibility of the youngest. I think, I didn't go back and look between, but I think he was like four or five, right? His responsibility, take care of the goldfish, okay? Probably heard these stories before. You probably lived these stories before, right? Story goes, everything's normal. One day, as a four or five-year-old does, he's looking at everything going on. And he's thinking, the goldfish doesn't get to do what we're all doing. Right? Right? He's stuck in the bowl. The rest of us are all sitting here in the living room on the sofa together having fun. The dog's sitting on the sofa with us, but he's over there in the bowl. So the next day, the family eats dinner. They come into the living room as normal, and there is the goldfish laying on the sofa. <laughs> Dead. Because <laughs> that's not what the goldfish was made for. The goldfish wasn't made to be out on the sofa. See, the little boy looked at the goldfish, and, and we think it's cute, it's, an, it's a funny story, right? But he looked at the goldfish and thought that that bowl was confining to him. The rest of us are out here. The dog's even right here. The goldfish should be right here then too. He's stuck. So he takes him out of what he was created for and puts him on the sofa and ends in his death. The psalmist is trying to help us see. God is trying to help us see through the psalmist. That as our hearts are renewed in his grace and mercy to us, the one who created us, who knows, who knows what we were intended to delight in, who knows what life is for us, his ways and his commands and his paths are freedom to us because we get to actually live the way and experience and be satisfied by the very things we were created to be satisfied by and live in the very way that he created us to live. His word and his ways become for us like water to that goldfish. Anything else is like the sofa. Yeah, sure, he got to be with the family for a few minutes, but he's dead. It didn't lead to freedom. See, the psalmist didn't say, I, I, had to, I had to let go of my freedoms. I had to minimize my freedoms in order to follow you. He said, no, it being renewed by you. I, here's what I anticipate. As you save me by your steadfast love, as you renew me by your steadfast love, here's what I anticipate. I'm going to see more clearly that your paths and your ways are the paths to life and freedom for what I was created for. Remember, this is not a psalm about how to get scripture into your life. It's listening in on the overflow of honest eruption when what God has said has gotten into you. And this is what the psalmist is experiencing. He's anticipating as God renews his heart in the face of pressures and difficulties and slanders and taunts and oppositions and all the different things. All that may come from being steady in a life of obedience to the Father and his ways. Steady in a life of a long obedience in the ways of Jesus. Anticipating at these different crossroads all that's coming. As God gives him what he really needs. Which isn't a strategy to get around. 
but a heart that's renewed in who God is. It's okay. It's then I'll know how to step. I'll know what to say. Let them plot. Let them say what they're going to say. I'm not going to be ashamed. Rather, I'm going to be free. I'm going to be free. For, he says, I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. Let me just tell you, you you can't command this to somebody. Parents, teachers, ministry leaders in other places who are here, you can't command people to delight in God's word. You can't command them to delight in his law. You can't command them to delight in his ways. This is the overflow of a heart that is being renewed by and captivated by the steadfast love of God. It's the overflow of a heart that is seeing again and tasting again. Grace and the mercy of the faithful God towards those who in themselves don't deserve it. It's the overflow of a heart that's being captured again by seeing and enjoying the steadfast love of God to them in Jesus. You can't command it, but you can help take one another to the place where we can find him, see him, be renewed by him. Because as our hearts are, his commands become our delight. The psalmist says in verse 48, I I will lift up my hands towards your commandments, which I love, and I'll meditate on your statutes. The picture is one of surrender. So it's not a picture of one whose hands are like this. It's a picture of one whose hands are like this. Even at the end of the service sometimes when we say, lift up your hands, and we read from the scriptures and say a blessing to the people, it's not this, this. It's a hand of receiving, a hand of surrender. To your word and to your ways, I, I lift up my hands. I surrender. I open them up to receive them from you because I love them. They're the words of life. They're the way to life. Even when, even when everything around me feels like it's going to fall because of it. They're the way to life. Strategy is not some five-point way to get through taunts and difficulties. It's strategy is to get your heart happy in Jesus. Strategy is to ask God to make you satisfied in his steadfast love. The strategy, tomorrow as the morning comes, the next day as the morning comes, the next day as the morning comes, and you don't know the cross or you're going to face that day, is to go into it with your heart satisfied by his steadfast love. That's the strategy. That's what we really need. Let me let Charles Bridges close our time this morning. Bridges was a a great 18th century pastor. He said, if the gospel, and you could substitute that with the grace and mercy, loving kindness, steadfast love of God, because it's seen in Jesus. If the gospel separates the heart from sinful delights, it's only to make room for delights of a more elevated, satisfying, and enduring nature. As God continues to work and satisfy you by his steadfast love and and overwhelms the the displeasures of sin, that expulsive power of that delight, pushing those things away, it's only, he says, because he's making room for greater delights. The riches of the inheritance of the saints in Jesus. Room for greater delights in God's steadfast love and faithfulness. And so Bridges says, "Do, do we find ourselves complaining of the dullness of heart that restrains that pleasure, the dullness of heart that that keeps us from from delighting in the steadfast love of God, delighting in his grace and mercy to us. He says, if that's the case, let us seek for a deeper impression of redeeming love. That's what the psalmist is doing in verse 41. 
bring to me your steadfast love. Renew me in your steadfast love. Bridget says, seek a deeper impression of that steadfast love on your heart because this will be the spring of grateful obedience and holy delight. Let us turn our complaints about the dullness of our heart into prayers and the Lord will quickly turn them into praises. Let us watch against everything that would intercept, right? It's football weekend, right? Intercept our communion with Jesus. Be watchful for anything that would keep you away from seeing and enjoying and keeping company with Jesus. The one by which our heart is renewed and restored, right? As Bridges said, distance from Jesus. Anything that gets in the way there and keeps you away, having distance from Jesus will always be accompanied with poverty of spiritual enjoyment. Want to be delighted and renewed in the steadfast love of God towards you? Spend some time with Jesus. Get your heart renewed by Jesus. He closes by quoting Psalm 36, they who feast on the abundance of your house. Those who come to feast on the abundance of your steadfast love and, and faithfulness, you give them drink from the river of your delight. Who doesn't want that? Drink from the river of God's delight. For with you, the psalmist says, is the fountain of life. In your light do we actually see light. You pray for us this morning as we prepare to respond. Good and gracious heavenly father, I, I, I can't even say it better than the psalmist. Please, according to your promise and according to the, the measure of your power, renew our hearts in your steadfast love this morning. Give us eyes to see and a spiritual taste to be satisfied only in your grace and mercy to us in Jesus. Stoke our delight in you, our joy in you, like a furnace. Let our hearts be like a furnace. Get our hearts so hot in joy, so hot in delight in your son, that all the fears and all the anxieties, all the temptations to find another way when the pressure comes, all of them will begin to melt away in the heat of our happiness and joy in you. That is a, a miraculous work of your spirit in our hearts through your word as we see you. We ask that you would do that according to the greatness of your power for our joy. Jesus' name, amen.